title of my session has a typo on it, and it really should have been the tension between the user and the instructor. So I apologize for that kind of misleading subtitle. Um, I'm here today to, this was really supposed to be a questioning assumption session. So I don't, this is all the visual I have. I'm not going to march everybody through a deck. Um, and I really want this to be a dialogue because this is a, kind of a philosophical question I've been wrestling with since I've been doing this for a living. And to me, I've, only, I've always sort of flailed about like it's a, a Zen calm, like what's the sound of one hand clapping? Because it's a, it's a dilemma in what we do at MIT OpenCourseWare. And so I have to believe that others of you are dealing with this as well. You have in your institutions, if you're doing an open course where you've got material from instructors that you want to help to get online in an open environment. Instructors will use third party materials in their teaching because that's how academia works. So in getting those third party materials that are vital to their teaching, sometimes you can license them openly from the copyright holders and sometimes you can't. So you end up with this polarization where you've got um, an open educational resource that is totally and completely portable. You can reuse, remix, whatever the license terms under which you publish enable you to do, but there are some holes in it. So you end up with a resource like CC Share -a -lots. Or you make some choices to keep that stuff in using a fair use claim, for example, or, or some other alternative that you have. Um, but you end up with an object that has to stop at the border. It's an, uh, you know, I can share everything but these small little bits and pieces. And we have some kind of anecdotal feedback from our users around the impact of those choices on our content. Um, but I really want to hear from other people that wrestle with this stuff every day. You know, what what are the pros and cons as you experience them to these sorts of choices? Do you end up going the total open license as much as you can and put as much in the commons as you can, knowing that you have to sacrifice some things? And or or do you sort of go the more conservative route and keep stuff in as much as possible? Um, knowing that it's not all portable, it's not all reusable. Okay. Just go. Yes? Is there a place where you could go and say, like, I don't know if this exists, but a place where you could go and say, hey, open community, I need an image of this, or I, I have this hole, and does anybody have something that would fill that in? Flicker. If you go on to Flickr and you want to find uh, images that are totally compatible with your license, your publishing license, you can plug in the elements of the CC license that you use and it will return back images if, that match that. If there's a hole, then there, like, if you don't get a response in Flickr, there, if there was a place that you could go and say, does anybody else have, you know, with this huge community? Does anyone, I, I don't have an answer to that. But Google, anyone, you could just go to Google and yeah. get the type of license you want and it will show you. But again, I mean, you go to Google and you can't find that picture that you want. You can't find something that will substitute for that. And so what I'm wondering is if there's a way to, to put that request out there to the community or maybe somebody would build it. Maybe somebody would, um, you know, have pieces that they could donate that, you know, so that you can create that resource. The only thing I know of is uh, OER Africa has put it, has a sort of request facility where you can request OER to fill um, curriculum gaps, but it's not like it's not like individual images or pieces of it. The gentleman back there. I was going to suggest Wikimedia Commons. I don't know if they have if they have a request feature built into it, but um, there's certainly a huge database of open source images. So these are all really good resources. Um, I think the the challenge of those is finding exactly the right image that you want. And that's something that, that's an option that we take at MIT OCW where we go out and we find open and licensed alternatives or we have a graphic designer to recreate 
a, a, an open version of the original. Um, but one instructor said to me once, well, I chose that image because it exactly demonstrates the point I'm trying to make here. And I know I can have alternatives, but they're just not quite right. Yeah. At, at Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, we started out by, by doing almost exclusively slides with, without audio. Mm -hmm. And then as we, as we started adding audio to our open courseware, we, we, we um, made the content more rich um, by doing that, but then we also made it much harder to deal with these situations because when you have a company in audio, if the instructor is talking about something that's supposed to be there and it's not there, or it's been replaced by something that's suitable, but you know the colors don't match up or it's not precisely the, the right match, it gets even more complicated. So by enriching the content in one way, we're actually creating a condition where we have to drop more stuff out because we can't find the exact match to avoid some sort of cognitive dissonance where they're hearing the instructor say one thing and they're seeing something else yeah. on the slide. Uh, yeah. uh, at the Open University, we then open them we had a sort of system of uh, identifying things that we can't clear the rights for, haven't cleared the rights for, clear the rights, and then replacing them if we can. But sometimes you can't replace them at all. And I think that part of this discussion is about who's doing the effort sharing because if we're talking about funded projects then maybe there are people there who are funded to do this activity but if you're talking about an individual um, educator who's got a resources they're keen to share are they expected to go through and do all of this so maybe in fact you, what you do is you put a blank space and say this had an image of this sort of thing I'd love you to find one mm -hmm. um, because Chances are somebody out there might go and find something that you don't know about, or even make something to share. I brought with me some of our very rich and well argued user feedback in reaction to our our issues. People that you know face the slide on the right. I think that the extent of your copyright deletions are excessive. John Littman, class of 1976. And that's a short one. <laughs> I got a long one. You know, goes on and on and on and on and on. I understand the intellectual property and liability concerns, but the frequency of image removed due to copyright is very disheartening, especially when the image is central to the lesson item. It compromises the entire learning experience and renders some entire lessons useless. He's right. He's absolutely right. But it's the it's the very imperfect system we got. Yeah. Why can't we have both? Well, we do have both at MIT. And we put out stuff like that on the left. <coughs> but it's less portable. Is that what you mean by both? When no, you no I mean both. Like, why don't you put out both? Why don't, why don't you have a fully clear copy that you put out that might have deletions, but it's fully portable, and then you've got a more comprehensive um, sort of in, uh, where where you keep the integrity of the lesson. Well, I think put that out as well. I mean, I can answer for for yeah. our shop, and it goes back to our mandate when we first published, which was to publish everything, absolutely everything, under one license. The our foundation, uh, the Hewlett Foundation, said you must put it all out under one license even if it means you end up with holes like that. Because they wanted no ambiguity about the portability of our content. They wanted to enable accessibility and reusability as much as possible. So when we adopted the Fair Use Code and started doing what you see on the left, that was really controversial and had to you know, be approved by committee and everyone had to wring their hands over it and think about it and are you sure it's going to be okay? And, Will the users accept this? And um, <laughs> there's been no difference really in user feedback. So our silent majority of users continue to do what they do, which in the back of my mind makes me think they don't care what our license says. They're just going to behave as they always have been. This just makes it a little more transparent about what our intentions are. Um, but as to why we don't have two parallel products, two parallel versions of the same course, labor. It's really just the work involved. I 
I, that would probably be the most practical reason why. Yeah. We, we ran into a very similar project. We were dealing with an architecture faculty member who was extraordinarily well connected with us. So he was able to get you know, that precise image of that building to the illustrator. And every institution we, we gave him, he's like, no. It was just horrible. It completely misses the point. Same building, same facade. Slightly different lighting conditions. Right. Useless image. Um, so what we ended up doing is we realized that as we went through more and more of that, that the course was not so much about the building, it's about his take on the building. So our asset became, you know, so our we ended up flipping the video frame to make it very much Jeff Kepnes lecturing it, and then up in the corner, under the pixel count that falls under fair use guidelines according to our lawyers, is every image that he got, but the pixel count, you know, that we had cleared from fair use, that this is small enough, you can't say we're degrading the commercial value of the image. Right. Well, you came to us early, so we'll back you when you get sued. So, I mean, we, that, and that was a really nice process because that, that enabled us to abandon the clearing infrastructure mm -hmm. and put the focus on, this isn't about the building. This mm -hmm. is about, come see this critic talking. Yeah. And yeah. it's that performance that we're showing, and Jeff owns his performance. Right. When we do include things under fair use, I don't know if that reads real rightly and well. Um, we put this up. It, it's hard to read, I know, but it's a source unknown. All rights reserved. This content is excluded from our Creative Commons license. And then we link back to our policy on our, you know, that explains our, our utilization of fair use to include certain things. But it's very clear here that, yeah, here's the, here's the item that we chose not to request permission for because we Value, uh, we evaluated it and met the fair use argument. <laughs> I'm out of stretch. Um, but there it is right there. You can't take it with you. If you want to reuse this, you've got to make that call yourself as to whether you think your use is fair. You know, I don't know if that's what the user of an OER wants to have to do. So. Yeah, we've given you something that where you totally get the point of this slide. You totally get the message the instructor's trying to convey, but you can't reuse that unless you figure out whether you can. And a lot of people don't want to put that much thought into it. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to. So I, I was thinking about um, one of the Venn diagrams that Josh Jarrett put up yesterday, quality and impact usage and distribution and sustainability. And I, so I, I'm like focusing on the quality, impact, and usage distribution circles right here. And how those are always sort of in tension with each other. You, if you have a really complete, rich product, publication, that you will be sacrificing some usability because of the realities of copyright law and the CC licensing infrastructure. And there are there are parties out there that simply will not grant us the terms we're asking for. So, yeah. so what would happen if... I'm if, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The one behind you. I was thinking of the other circle. I noticed you always say, because what was mentioned this morning was that Athabasca requires people to look at OER sources. So are we talking about sort of legacy problem where people mm -hmm. didn't have OER sources, didn't have the book in the institute. Are you seeing any change in where people are going? Are you encouraging them to to head off this problem of the past in the future yeah. by looking at different places. At MIT, that's a really big part of the conversations we have with faculty. Um, because they hold the copyright to their teaching materials, and they're the ones who decide what uh, secondary resources they're going to use in, in their content. We can encourage and point them to as many openly licensed content as possible. But you know, you all, you're, some of you are instructors here. You'd be, really annoyed if people like us came and told you what to do and what to put into your teaching content. So that gets some traction and we've certainly had some members of our faculty over the eight years we've been doing this get hit to it, but certainly not on a critical mass where it's really radically changing how we're able to publish their content. Yeah? Can we just sneak in? Sorry, I'm cheating here a bit. <laughs> What do you do about accessibility? I mean, do you do a full alt description 
a tight description of what's there for people who can't see it. We do we do um, alt text and accessibility tagging for stuff that is the instructor's material. For third party things like these images that belong to third parties, we don't. And you, if you want. Yeah, I was. I, I just was wondering. I think it would be really nice if there was a, maybe even a partnership with some of these design. I mean, the the things that they were talking about yesterday. These students are going out and they're creating all this really cool stuff. It'd be really neat if there's a place where you could say, hey, here's here's an image that I'm interested in having an open copy of, and yeah. would somebody be willing to make it for me? And you know, there's students out there who would definitely benefit, but then you would need a place, and I don't know where that place, like where you take mm -hmm. that image to mm -hmm. have it. Yeah. Uh, like a, who was it, Jacques Duplessis was talking yesterday about the pantry. Yeah. I knew it was in his, in his speech. Um, where you really need to pay careful attention to that model is that you have to have subject matter experts as the people that are generating these alternative images. Because you can't have, you know, a watercolor painter mock up, a, you know, a turbine engine that's going to exactly meet the needs of that. Maybe you could, but you know, you wouldn't go to that person first. You would go to someone who's working in that field. So it's a great idea, and I, there's probably a lot there. Um, but even an interaction between the requester and the person who's delivering the the product, you know, that there would be a lot of learning that would go on for the person who's delivering the product yeah. about turbines and mm -hmm. whatever else. But if you had a model that you were going off of. Mm -hmm. That's part of the process that we do at MIT with our authoring team. There's a group of graphic artists that make our commissions for us. You know, we'll say, we've got this diagram of a cell, for example, and it's got these attributes. Can you make a new diagram of a cell that has these attributes? And very often there's three or four rounds of back and forth over email about, no, it's not quite right. Could you change this? Could you add that? This needs some texture, you know. It's very communications intensive, so it's not impossible, but it's a lot of work. We do end up with a much more complete resource when we go that route, but it, there are significant costs with that approach as well. Yes? So one question I have is like, from a user perspective, like you kind of mentioned that we don't really care about copyright most of the time, like yeah. it's free, like yay, like they're happy. Right. Um, so, like the open community, we're very interested in like you know reuse, revise, and things like which you need an open license to do. Uh -huh. But like, what could be possible if we just maybe focus on just like get as much free, high quality content as possible? It's widely available, and like you not care so much about the reuse, revise, and mix. Would that be? What's your take on that? Would that be a horrible thing? Or? Well, it depends. Institutionally, MIT OCW publishes under the CC BY NCSA license. So everything we put out has to follow that licensing structure, but also the ethos behind it. Um, and that's our, that we're constrained by our institutional setting to do that. But there's a lot of other activity in this space that isn't constrained by that really rigid infrastructure around it, where they can take a much more progressive approach and you know get much more creative with how they're putting things together. You know, I don't think it's the right solution for us because of who we are. Um, but as individuals, as, as individual educators or um, people that are creating content to be consumed in this space, we've got a much wider uh, range, you know, playing field to play on. And so, so that, I mean, that makes me think that, that for um, institutional OCW producers like your shop and my shop and, and a few others in this room, that we really need to, to focus on, on um, enriching the commons. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the people who do have the freedom um, without as much institutional restraint as we have to practice, um, we're, we're providing raw materials that, that they can use, and the more we clutter up our raw materials with stuff that they can't do anything with, 
and that they might be confused about what they can do with it, or they or they might not have the, as much confidence about using, then um, you know we're doing them a disservice. We can't you know we can't necessarily do all the cool stuff, right? Um, uh, but but we can give you something to do cool stuff with. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a story about something that happened a few years back um, where we came up with a blanket agreement with Elsevier. Uh, we, we had an agreement uh, where we're able to use, you know, up, there's a cap of a limit of um, three figures per article or 100 words per article from journals that we are licensing from them when they appear in our courses under our Creative Commons license. And now, that's been a huge boon to us in our publication because we haven't had to pull out all the little journal, journal articles and things. Um, our libraries weren't really happy with that deal when they heard about it because they said, why would you license this stuff? It's completely available to you under the terms of fair use. And it was this really strange moment of, you're absolutely right. Fair use is a completely viable alternative for us, except we, with this license, can now put these little graphs and tables and excerpts of text into the commons. So we've taken completely locked down proprietary content and put it into the commons. But from the library's perspective, that didn't really count as much. Now, we all have you know, valid arguments for and against this agreement, but it's an example of how we took something, put it in the comments, and we thought it was a good deal. Uh, you had a question back there? Uh, a point about fair use. It, uh, it's not the same around the world. That's right. So the idea of trying to get something into Creative Commons um, is a you know, perfect argument for your library. You know, nope. you're, you're serious about getting stuff but the, the other argument, and I can see it from the American point of view, is you're creating a precedent of you're saying uh, uh, that this isn't fair use by getting a license from them. You're admitting that you, you believe that this is, I can't do this by fair use. That, yeah, so, that was the implicit I mean, both are statement right. you're, you're absolutely right. Now, yeah. in, in another jurisdiction, um, the fair dealing in, in this is different. Mm -hmm. But for the American uh, uh, context, to give in on that principle is a big mistake. I yeah. think I think the librarians are right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sort of even worse, uh, a number of those images are like graphs. They're very basic data representations yeah. that aren't actually covered by copyright in US law. Yeah. And so attaching a CC license to it um, is in, in effect acting as though it even has copyright protection when it should. And in effect, it is taking something that is in the public domain exactly. and putting it behind a a fence. very open and transparent fence, but a fence nevertheless. Right. So this was not without controversy. And what are the statutory damages in the US if, you, if somebody gets to you? I don't think they ever have. At least $150,000. Yes, so that's why I know in the new copyright bill in Canada, it's gone down to 2500 It used to be 50000 per instance. Yeah. And at twenty five hundred dollars, my guess is take the whole gray area right. and take the risk. Take but the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a time, you might be a bit more cautious. It also yeah. depends on who you are. Yeah. Um, so, like, I, I'm at University of Michigan, which is a public institution. So we're actually governed, or we're protected by the state, and so people can't actually sue us. For money. They can sue the state. Right, but they can't sue the state for money. Only. Yeah. Um, just jump yeah. Well, then you take, yeah, you take the whole, there's a huge gray area, a huge gray area, take it. Take it. I mean, why, why university librarians think that they're officers for enforcing the copyright of the, uh, uh, of the publishers? I don't know why they would think that. Like, you know, they're paid by the university. Okay. We have one time, one last question. Oh, quick poll. How many people in this room have been sued for copyright? <laughs> so why are we talking about this? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stick up my hand as somebody who used to get um, complaints about copyright misuse in an institutional world. It does happen. People do I seem know. to spend their time trawling for instances of their diagram having been 
Yeah, but it's yeah, complaints. It's, it's, it's complaints, not sewer. It's complaints. Well, we haven't we haven't used their dialogue. Just some um, But in the UK, one of the complications is that the individual can be sued as well as the institution, as well as whoever provided the system for the it's just a really horrible civil criminal thing. Alright, I think the time is up, so um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about this who likes to wrestle in the gray philosophical space like I do. Thanks, Thank you very much. <laughs>